Thanks a lot, Frodan. I am here with Brian Kibler and Sol to give you a bit of a wrap-up of the day and just yet another amazing day we've had. Day one got off to an explosive start and continued to be really exciting, and day two has not really been a letdown at all. Uh, no, and uh, you know, as as Hot Meow said, every single player from the Americas region has made it through. And uh, how how many from Europe? I just I just want to know. Do you do you happen to know? Okay. We got Doctor Hippie. We got Doctor <laughs> Hippie in the dream. <laughs> it's all We're we in there. Yeah, so thanks for that, Kibla. got right no in problem. there, no messing about. Uh, really appreciate it. But we can check out the brackets and how they look within each group, as this is now, you know, two days in, really shaping up to get uh, to get our eight players through to the BlizzCon finals. It's going to be Sidonia and Jason Joe going through in the winners, and Handsome Guy and Tice going to be playing in the lower elimination match. And, and that, that lower bracket match is one that has to have a lot of people, you know, kind of biting their finger. Right. Those are, those are some, some players who were chosen very highly uh, for the chooser champion. Yeah, in Group B, we saw the, the match we saw today, Chonsu defeating Hamster. The uh, the Priest and Paladin dream didn't work out for him. He'll go on to meet BB Gun Gun, and Naaman will be waiting for Hamster in the lower bracket, so the chance of redemption for Hamster, but just another really tough opponent for him. Yeah, this is swiftly becoming a theme as we move on to Group C. We had Amnesiac oh. beat Yulsik, oh. and he's going to be facing Dr. Hippie in the winner's bracket. I cannot wait for that one. That's going to be so big. And in the lower side of that bracket is going to be Breath versus Yulsik. So we move swiftly on to Group D, and Omega Zero going to be facing off against the winner of the match we just saw, Hot Meowth. Uh, he said he was uh, feeling confident going in, but that series was by no mean an e uh, by no means an easy one for him. He's going to face Dione and Pavel. Uh, they're going to face off in the lower bracket of Group D as well. But let's uh, go back a little bit. It's been a long day. It's been uh, many great matches of Hearthstone. But go all the way back to the first match of the day, which was Jason Zhou versus Tyson. Uh, this was a tense one, Kibler. Yeah, this was a matchup that a lot of players were looking forward to, a lot of fans were looking forward to. Oh, yeah. Tyce, uh, you know, very, very popular player, popular streamer. And, and I have to imagine you know, lots of people out there who were, were sighing and sad when ultimately it was Jason Zhou who took it. Though I, I think that he was the player who performed better in the series. I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, Jason Zhou, there were a few missteps from Tice, particularly uh, in his Hunter game, where he just gave way too much value to a Swash Burglar with the traps that he played. Uh, but Jason Zhou just played incredibly well throughout. And I think you can comfortably say that he outplayed Tice over the course of the series, where, you know, if, if you're the better player in a series and the guy on the other side is Tice, that's pretty <laughs> impressive yeah, stuff. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I think that Tice. Maybe the pressure of so many people having such expectations might have gotten to him sure. because you know, he he did you know to his own admission play relatively poorly in some of those games and it really came back to haunt him. As you mentioned, this game in particular, you know, Tice had a few missteps with uh, his use of his traps in the yeah. early game, allowing that Swatch Burglar to to break two of them, yes. and just narrowly lost a game that very easily could have been his with a couple of different decisions. Yeah, but particular shout-outs, Jason Joe played incredible when Joe yeah. Ryder said that, but particular shout-outs to the way he played his control warrior. Oh, yeah. It's no surprise that this is a guy that's you know been advertised as having 20,000 control warrior <laughs> wins or something ridiculous. He had a very losable game against the Druid during that series, and he navigated through it perfectly. Yeah, it was really strong performance from him. I look forward to see his next match up as we move through the brackets. But moving on, it was going to be the second series of the day, which was Chonsu versus Hamster, the one we got to cast. And yeah. like you said, sort of the uh, the Priest and Paladin dream didn't quite work out for Hamster, although he had some extremely close Priest games. Yeah, I think he would have been looking at um, the, the players involved, looking at the lineups that came out. And, you know, Chansu's lineup particularly is probably the one that he just didn't want to deal with. You know, the big chunky mid-range hunter, the dragon warrior, like these are decks that just beat up on some of the strategies that he brought. So maybe he'll have a better chance in the lower bracket against some of the things that Naaman is trying to do. But for this series, uh, the, the deck matchups just weren't really there. And it wasn't a class thing. It was just that his, his overall strategy is aimed at control so heavily that Chansu's decks just took him out. It kind of felt to me like maybe he, he navigated the, the games a little bit kind of passively. He, okay. he, he took he took like an extremely value-oriented route. I mean, look at this game against the Druid. He, he dies with so many cards yes. in his hand. Yes. And he had a lot of opportunities to, to use his removal in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, there was a, an instance where he used Entomb on an uprooted Ancient of War, which he could have killed with the Excavated Evil. Excavated and Living Roots, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the Living Roots. Yeah. And that's a matchup where there's a lot of big threats, and it's really crucial as the Priest to use your removal as effectively and as conservatively as possible. Yeah, but, you know, by no means anything bad onto Chansu. He, yet again, you know, we've seen him play multiple times now. Just played super solid. And as we said, you know, right in the pre-show all the way at the start of today, 
Playing solid is actually just enough most of the time. It's really, a lot of the time, it's who can make the least mistakes in a yeah. situation like this. Yeah, solid is, is often just good enough. He, he, not making mistakes is a really key point for him. He, he hasn't done anything that's like blown my mind in, in terms of, wow, that was an amazing play, like that's so insightful, but he's just not really making big errors. He's playing matchups well. He's committing the right amount of pressure to the board when he's playing the aggressor. He's holding his resources well enough when he's control, and it's, it's just doing enough for him right now. Yeah, and then moving on to match three of the day, which was a very confident Amnesiac versus Yulsik. And again, this series, you know, Amnesiac had a few, at least for me, just a, a few points where it looked a little bit rough in right. moments. But overall, he said, you know, in his interview, he was happy with how he played and he was pretty confident throughout the whole series. Yeah, I mean, Amnesiac has run this set a million times. We've all seen it happen on various people's streams, and he was struggling early on and generally found some, some keys that was helping him to, to dominate the matchup, and the, the banning mage strategy kind of came out of nowhere and really ended up potentially being crucial. If there was maybe one weak point for him, it was the, the warrior play, where maybe he, he skirted the line again in the game against the Shaman, um, but you know, honestly, pretty comfortable for him overall in this series. Yeah, ultimately, he was able to navigate you know the, the, a, a tough matchup here. You know, maybe a couple things he could have done a little bit better but it was good enough and uh able to take down the win yeah you know i agree uh, what do you actually think of the mage ban kibler because it was something that as you said so quite rightly comes out of nowhere no one's banned mage unless it was freeze mage like a while ago in a long long time it made a lot of sense to me just given the dynamic of his mat his uh lineup and it's part particularly built to target shaman clearly not going to ban shaman in that, in that instance and he has the better hunter deck for the hunter mirror match and his hunter deck is good against druid and and you sort of go down the line it's like well where's my weak point it's like okay i think that mage may have the best chance to take wins against a lot of his decks yeah, the, the targeting Shaman thing there is actually quite important because we've seen a couple of people with that strategy and key in that series is that Amnesiac didn't let the Shaman get through. We've mm -hmm. seen that happen in, in other people's games where they are targeting Shaman, but the fact Amnesiac was able to lock it out over a couple of games was really huge for his overall game plan. Yeah, and we actually have the young Savage himself with Frodan to go a little bit deeper into the series and how he thought it went. That's right, I'm joined by Amnesiac for just some follow-up comments. First off, how'd you get the nickname? The Young Savage. Who gave it to you? Yeah, the Young Savage is a rich and deep history, Dan. <laughs> oh, dates back to this, the years of yours. Is that what happened? Yeah, it's been passed down through the generations. <laughs> nah, but my uh, my friend, my friend who was also a Twitch streamer, just kind of one day was like, "Yeah, I think he's kind of young. He's kind of savage. Maybe we should just call him Young Savage." Everyone's like, "Nah, it's not gonna stick. There's no way." Yeah. And here we are. And here we are, man, and you're tearing it up. I think you're the only player who's been able to walk through the doors, sit down, win the series, and be happy with his play. I think almost every player who's done interviews and sat in that seat says, ah, man, I could have done a lot better. I wasn't playing my ability. But you said that you were pretty happy with your plays. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think game one, pretty straightforward. Turn five kill, that's, that's a good game. Mm. Game two, I had one pretty crucial decision point, I think, where I increased my percent by a lot. I would have won if I played a different way because I drew pretty specifically what I needed, but I was really happy. Uh, it was the turn where he went huge toad and he taunted Not it up, master. and he had the 5-4. So I think kind of instinctively I was thinking, all right, I could just kill command, quick shot him in the head, put him mm -hmm. to three. But then I only actually have three outs through the taunt. I have the second kill command, the second quick shot, and the second explosive trap to set up lethal. Whereas the way I played it, where I went kill command quick shot, cleared it, and then I pushed five. I pushed less damage, but he had to answer my three four. So a lot of the time he has to proc the freezing trap with a one one, then trade. And then he's pushing one damage and he's at six. So he's almost never gonna win from that spot. Whereas he could have very realistically counter lethaled me if I had gone all in and then I whiffed the damage because he could have put me to like 20 and played a minion. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, I was happy with that play. That was just giving myself more percent in a favorable position. Absolutely. I think inevitability played a huge factor in how many turns your opponent had to kill you with yes. just a 1-1 one, one on board attacking. Sure. Yeah, that's a really nice play there that he's able to spot. I mean, definitely we were surprised when we thought through it. Definitely could agree with that too. Um, you know, they also had some tight moments too, especially navigating some really difficult warrior decisions. Uh, what, what about those games stuck out to you? Yeah, those games were weird. I hadn't played a pan out like that very often because Brawl was kind of tucked away in my deck. I didn't find one in the top 20. And that wasn't particularly unfortunate or anything. I just wasn't really used to it. So there were a couple boards where I was like, well, I'd usually just Brawl this and then I'd save my, my hard removal. But I didn't have that, so I had to use it. So I got a little creative. Like the turn where I chose to Grom the minion, that was very deliberate because I had seen early in the game that he'd hexed the Baron Gun. So I was like, 
Okay, well, I need more removal this game because I don't have Brawl. So I'm going to try and get, get him hexed this, and it's going to prevent him from lethaling me with anything. I had done the math. Thunder Bluff hitting uh, Spell Power Totem was one off, yeah. or two off or something, and he was down both his Flame Tongues at this point. So I couldn't die. So I was trying to get him to hex it so that Syl would act as removal, which it generally just gets hexed against Shaman, because I knew I needed more removal if I was going to go to Fatigue and take uh, the long game. Ah, I get it. So you're trying to leverage your minions to start yes. acting as removal spells, because if you use a Shield Slam, you're still going to build up that pressure. Okay, that's really creative, man. I like that, as you said. And of course, you ripped the double brawl eventually. Yeah, it eventually mean, came I, I, into they, your they hand. Came, they came. Yeah. <laughs> it was cool. Um, you know, definitely interesting, too. Why Why also just like this older school variant of Warrior? What What purpose did it serve? Is it, was it to target Shaman or was it to cover other matchups? I just like the ability to actually flip the switch and be aggressive that Alex Straza provides. Uh, in a lot of matchups, you do want to be the initiator right now. Mm -hmm. So, like, against Druid, if you can't get something going early, then just flipping them to 15, playing an 8-8 can be a great way to divert their resources. And overall, in the game plan of trying to fatigue them, forcing them to use Moonfire's swipes, forcing them to use resources prior to when they want to to deal with your aggression is a good way to get to fatigue, even though you're taking the act of the aggressor. So it helps in that way. It also just helps the Shaman matchup a lot. It was very weird how it helped the Shaman matchup. Usually you Alex Straza them. <laughs> yeah. But in this case, it was just good enough. I just had an 8-8 eight eight in my deck, and that got there. So it, it worked here as well. Yeah, and like you said, exhausting his second hex already. So that way, Sylvanas and leading his Alex Straza yes. definitely was good play as well. Congratulations, man. How do you feel about going against Dr. Hippie, a another player receiving a lot of hype this year? Yeah, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Hippie. I think he is the second best player in this tournament behind me there you go young savage strikes again <laughs> but yeah i have i have a lot of respect for how he played i think he brought a really good lineup uh it should be a really good series yeah, all right well uh thankfully that you're able to go through i know a lot of people put their bets on packs you already won them one uh so you know people are going to try to recover you, even though you did win your first match against yosek he has another chance to go through and even though you burned tj so savagely he's no longer casting with us at least for today hopefully he makes it come back too thanks for stopping by this is amnesiac who won his first game in group c let's head over back to the side table to wrap up the day Thanks a lot, Frodo and Amnesiac, of course. Some really great insights there from him. You know, he's one of the players who I just love to listen to. Yeah. Because he, he can really talk pretty well about the game and really open up some thought patterns on what he's actually performing in the series. But moving on to the last series of the day, the one we most recently saw, it was Hot Meowth versus Pavel. And in this series, we saw from Hot Meowth's, uh, from his interview, sorry, that he was, it was 4-1, but he felt very nervous throughout the whole series, Kibler. Yeah, I mean, they were, it was a 4-1 uh, record overall, but they were close games. You know, they were games that really could have gone either way. I mean, this you know, first one, uh, he did get massive value from the Ragnaros, ultimately winning the game with it. But until then, it was really back and forth the entire game. Yeah, it certainly was, and it, it really was a lot closer than the, the score score indicates even in the fact that you know Pavel had a lot of room for recovery in some of the games that he ended up losing you know particularly the control warrior mirror that we saw I'm I'm okay with the aggressive line that he took it's out of the norm but he has a weaker deck for the mirror anyway so I think he had to try and be aggressive what bothers me is that he kind of bailed out of that aggressive line halfway through. He could have played um, an, a brand Emperor Vecklor onto the board and got a bunch of 4-4s, four just bailed out of it and then fell short because of it. So I was expecting a lot better from Pavel, honestly, because if you look at his Gosu Gamers record, he's like 81 and 30 lifetime <laughs> in Hearthstone tournaments, which is insane. But hey, at least his Cardigan game is still on point. <laughs> And that's all that matters, of yeah. course, Sol. So, yeah, they were all the series from today. We have even more matches coming up tomorrow, so definitely don't miss it. We can check out the brackets one last time just to round up the day and see where we've ended up after two days of Hearthstone action. It's going to be Sidonia and Jason Joe in the winner's bracket of Group A, and then Handsome Guy and Tice facing off in the lower bracket with an elimination match. And then we have BB Gun Gun and Chansu playing in the decider for uh, Group A or rather the winner's bracket yes. for Group B, and then name it a hamster in that elimination match uh, a couple days from now. Yeah, and then in Group C, this is potentially the biggest clash of the tournament so far. Dr. Hippie and Amnesiac in the winner's bracket. It will be the winner's games of each group being played tomorrow. So if you're as excited for this game as I am, make sure you don't miss tomorrow. Uh, the lower bracket game there, Breath versus Yolsik.
Yeah, and then finally in Group D, we have Omega Zero versus Hot Meowth, the player we just saw take the last series of the day. And then in the lower bracket for the elimination match is going to be Dione versus Pavel. But that is going to be it from us today. Let us know how you thought today went. Were you correct in your predictions? And who do you think is going to perform well tomorrow when we have the winner's bracket matches? We are going to get four players guaranteed through to BlizzCon. Let us know who you think it's going to be. Tweet us at Play Hearthstone or check us out on Facebook from myself, Ryan Kibler, Sotl, the rest of the crew and casters. Have a great day and we'll see you next time.